So it was uh, <clears throat> September 15, uh, 2001. So it was four days after 9-11. And there were uh, three funerals that day. Uh, I think they were the first, the first three. All city uh, firefighters. The first one was uh, for Father Michael Judge. He was the uh, fire department chaplain. Uh, there was another one for uh, Peter Gancy. He was the uh, fire department chief at the time. And the last one was for William Finn. He was the uh, former chief of the department and actually former commissioner as well. I said his funeral mass that day. Um, it was in Bayside. And the reason I, I was there was uh, his... Uh, Chief Fian's son is a, a very good friend of my brother's, so he asked if I would do the uh, celebrate the mass, which I certainly was honored to do. Chief Fian was um, 42 years on the job. He was actually 71 on that day when he died, um, which in and of itself was kind of crazy. He was 71 years old, and he was sort of fighting a fire. Um, he was a legend. He, uh, I didn't, again, I didn't know him, man, but I realized immediately what a legend he was, just uh, like beloved and like, respected by everybody. He literally ha held every rank within the department. And I think he was the oldest firefighter to die in the line of duty ever. He certainly was that day. I think it might have been of all time. I went to the wake the night before the funeral, and it was a massive crowd. And I remember as I was uh, getting ready to leave, um, Chief's, uh, Chief Fian's son asked if uh, he, he kind of walked me, walked me out uh, to my car, and we talked a bit. His name is Bill as well, and uh, he just started to talk about his dad, his father. And I'll never forget it. I'll just never forget uh, kind of what he said and the way he said it. He just spoke with so much, so much pride and love and respect for his father. I remember he said to me, he, uh, he said he died the way he lived, serving people, sacrificing for others. He said to me that he died, he died doing what he loved. And his whole life was serving people. And he died doing just that. And I remember him telling me like he, he felt almost a peace with that. I mean, of course, grief and sadness. But there was a, a feeling of peace, like that's where he, sh that's where he should have been. And he spoke about just with, about gratitude um, for this great man and this great father and this great life. This was three days after 9-11, like it was three days after our Good Friday, our nation's Good Friday, his family's Good Friday. And he was talking about gratitude and peace. He was like this light I swear to you, he was like this in a very dark night, in a very dark moment in our time. He was like this kind of just this voice of light, this son of a hero. It's like, where does that come from? Like, where do you get that? I mean, he's a wonderful guy, so part of it is just flat out, it just came from his gut and his heart. But I think it also comes from another place. 
Like, it comes from Easter faith, I think. Easter faith fuels that kind of light and that kind of hope when Good Friday is all over the place, it seems to me. I think he chose Easter. And I suspect the reason he chose it was because he witnessed it in the course of his life in probably a thousand ways. So his instinct was to be hopeful and grateful in the midst of sadness. I know people who didn't choose light as a result of that day. I mean, you probably do too. Or some other Good Friday moment. Not just, not just that day, but people who just couldn't reconcile God in the craziness. They just, they couldn't get past how God could allow it. I mean, come on, who doesn't ask those questions when Good Friday crashes into our lives? God's seeming absence, or at least silence. Well, he's quiet on Good Friday, but not on Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday is when he speaks. That's when God has the last word. And very simply, it's like, this isn't over. And I think on some level, that's where, that's where he was coming from when he talked to me in that parking lot. You know, last night, we had the, the Easter Vigil down in St. Ignatius. Father Leo had it. And in his homily, he mentioned... Uh, I guess you were in the seminary at the time, uh, Auschwitz? He, um, well, you weren't in the seminary in Auschwitz. You were, um, <laughs> you, when you were in the seminary, uh, you visited, you were in Poland, and he talked about visiting uh, Auschwitz, the concentration camp, and he just said it was like the most horrible place he's ever been. It was sort of the, the darkest, most evil place he'd ever been. and. Uh, to the point where he said he was like, almost like sick to his stomach. That's how, how bad it was. The knowledge of what happened in that place. Like, Good Friday. But then he talked about uh, being, I guess, kind of touring through this awful place and then coming to the, the cell of uh, St. Maximilian Kolbe. Probably lots of you know his story, but he was a priest and he was a prisoner and he took the place willingly took the place of, a, of another prisoner who was sentenced to death he had children and a family and this priest didn't so he said I'll take this place and he sacrificed his life anyway he said that Father Leo just said that uh, as dark as and, and, and horrendous as this place was like when he walked into that cell the saint's cell it was like there was a sense of light and kind of hope. It kind of broke through. I mean, that's what Easter does, I think. That's what, and that's what Easter people do. Whether you're the son of a hero fireman or a martyr saint, I think it all comes from the same place. And it's the knowledge that this isn't it. There's more than here. Here matters, but there's more than here. And when we know that, and when we truly believe it, I just think we see life in a different way. You know, this first reading we heard, it's from the Acts of the Apostles. It's basically, it chronicles the church after the resurrection, the beginning of the church. And it says, it says that we were, we are witnesses of all that he did. 
They were witnesses. And then they became heroes because of what they saw. Sort of like we saw the light, so now we need to be the light, is what was being said, and it's what they did. And we're here in this parking lot this morning because of that. Just these people of the light, these Easter people over the course of 20 centuries, we just keep coming. Because as dark as a day can be, and as good Friday as a, a day certainly can be, like we know it doesn't end there. I was watching this, this interview not too long ago with, um, must have been about ten, a 10 year old interview with uh, Robin Williams. And uh, it was just kind of so sad oh, listening to this guy. He was, in this interview, he was just so hysterical and then and so talented. And, um, and he ended his life. You know, he just got, I guess he, he couldn't get out of Good Friday, whatever that was for him. So just watching and hearing this interview the, through the kind of the knowledge of how his life ended is just takes on another level. But it got me thinking about I think is, well, it's certainly my favorite movie of his. It's one of my favorite movies, period. Um, I've mentioned it a bunch of times up here. I mean, I just, Dead Poets Society is, I love it. I love it. Um, if you don't know it, it's about this, uh, he plays this teacher. It's a parable. It's a total Jesus parable. The names and faces have been changed, but it's the story of him. He's this teacher in this uh, high school, late 1950s, up in New England. It's a preppy, bowl, uh, a boys' boarding school, a bunch of rich kids. And their lives have already been determined for them by their very successful, powerful parents. They're going to go to this school or that school, and they're going to you know, get a degree in this, and they're just going to kind of rule the world. Um, and Robin Williams is this, this English teacher who's actually a graduate of the school, so he's from there. He's Jesus. Jesus was from there. He was one of the Pharisees. He was, he was part of the religious community. But at, at a certain point, he started to say, yeah, but you got it wrong. You don't have it fully right. And he started to fine tune it. And people started to listen. We know with Jesus. Well, uh, same thing with this movie. These, these high school boys start, who could care less about literature and poetry, begin to care about it. And they begin to love this teacher. And the authorities become threatened by precisely that, as did the authorities in Jesus' time. And so the students are like his disciples. And the administration is... They're the Pharisees. There's even a, a kid who betrays the teacher. He's a Judas figure. And what he says to these kids is like, don't, don't, don't let your parents decide the life you're going to live. I mean, don't, don't disrespect your parents, but don't feel like you have to do live your life through their, their lives. Like, live the life you were meant to live. So one kid becomes very sort of interested in, in acting, and his father has no patience, no use for it. This other kid is a, like desperately shy, and Robin Williams kind of brings him out of himself through the course of this movie. And he's got all these sort of Robin Williams-like, very unorthodox ways of teaching. And he's getting more popular, and the, the, the people in charge are getting, uh, are getting more and more uncomfortable with it. There's one great scene where he's, he says to the kids, like, everybody get up on your, stand up on your desk. So they're standing on the top of their desks, and he says, you need to see the world from a different perspective. You can't always see it from the same place. You get in a, you get in a, different, a different perspective, and you see it different, and that's a good thing. It may not be the only place to see it, but it's legitimate. Anyway, so they're standing on their desk, and when the, one of the administrators walks by and he sees this, and it's like, it's like one more nail in the coffin. 
Anyway, like Jesus, he's betrayed. Like Jesus, he's falsely accused. He's fired. Like the Gospels, these kids are just, they were forced to, well, not, in the movie, the kids were forced to sort of betray him. And they're, they're, they're sick about it. They can't believe what they've done. And there's this final scene, is just, it's it. It's, the kids are now back in class, and the, the headmaster, the principal, essentially, he's now subbing. This is the guy that tossed them. And Robin Williams, it's his last day, and he, he interrupts the class, and he has to go into the closet to, to get his whatever, his materials to leave. So it's very disruptive, and you know everybody's focused on that. He comes out of the clock, he starts to walk out of the room and he walks past the kids and then one of the kids turns to apologize and he says, it's okay, it's okay. And the teacher is trying to, he wants him out of the room and just he wants control. And he starts to walk out of the room a little further and this kid, the one who was the shyest of them all, is such a great scene, he stands up and then he steps up on top of the desk. And the teachers, I can't believe what he's doing. And then the camera goes to the other kids and they're, they're like trying to decide, Am I, what do I do? And then one by one, they get up and stand up on the, on the desk as the sign of you know, defiance, courage. It's like in this dark moment of regret and injustice, there's light. Like these kids sort of take the torch, and they run with it. Hey, there's a lot of Good Friday out there, isn't there? Look at this last year. There's a lot of hurting people. There's a lot of injustice. There's a lot of wrong and a lot of sin. We need witnesses. Those witnesses that were referenced in that reading, we need more. We need light and we need hope in a world which lacks both. We need you to be that light and to be that hope to be Easter people. So find a desk. 